Many of us have a clouded understanding of our nation's history, especially as it relates to Native Americans. But Mark Charles, a Navajo pastor and U.S. presidential candidate, went to great lengths to experience this history firsthand. And this is your parents' hogan here? This is my, my parents' hogan. My grandparents originally bought property in this land. We're not on the Navajo reservation, although we're on the traditional land of our Navajo people. And my father told me this story that uh, when they were building the house and they would bring my grandparents up here to see it, uh, my grandmother commented to my father. And she said, you know, your Che, your grandfather used to live in the canyon not too far from here, just over the hill. So this is talking about the time yeah. of the long walk, both before and after, which is a very pivotal point for our, for our Navajo people. Yeah. So to hear that story of our relatives grew up in this area, in these same forests, in these same canyons, in these same hills, very, very meaningful for me to be here. Yeah. You know, we have as Navajo people, we have our four sacred mountains, yeah. which is where our defined our traditional lands and every time I come home and I'm back between our four sacred mountains again I feel very at home mm. I feel very much like yeah this is where I like to be this is where I feel most at peace this is where I feel I feel the best Mark grew up in Gallup New Mexico near the Navajo reservation and after graduating college and starting a family he moved to the reservation in order to reconnect with the lifestyle his grandparents and fellow Navajo people experienced. I could still do work there because there was only one artificial light you could see from our Hogan. You know, we're six miles off and there's paved road on a dirt road, no running water, no electricity. The only light you could see besides satellites yeah. from our Hogan was a cell phone tower about five miles away. So what made you decide to do that? How do you go from, <laughs> you know, living in a metropolitan area saying, I'm going to take my family, right, and move to this out in the middle of nowhere Hogan? Well, at the time, I was the pastor of a church, and there was a native church called the Christian Indian Center. The first question the, the consistory or the, the, the elder board of the church posed to me was they said, our last pastor introduced us to the concept of contextualizing worship for native cultures and we want you to lead us into that. I said, that sounds great. How do you spell it? Like, I had no clue what they were talking about. And so my wife and my son and I and a few members of our church, we went to Hawaii and we spent some time at this, this conference interacting with indigenous leaders from all over the world. Now, most indigenous peoples, not just here in the US, but all over the world, have the experience of what I would call being colonized by the gospel. The message was, you need to become a Christian, and to become a Christian, you first have to become Western European. You have to learn our language, you have to learn our culture, you have to speak like us, act like us. You know, this was what the boarding schools were all about. It was to kill the Indian to save the man. Yeah. And so I, I went to this conference, opened my eyes. We began trying to contextualize within our own congregation because of some research I had done in college on time perception rather than just talking about the forms of worship and the language we worship in and the food we serve I said how about the structure of the service because if Western time is linear based on a schedule and native time is circular based on completing the task if you want native peoples to truly worship within their own context yeah. it, it to say you have 45 minutes or 75 and a half minutes on a Sunday mid-morning, that's not going to cut it. Yeah. You know, you need to have a more open. So we, we began working with the structure of the service. Yeah. After doing that for about two years, I decided, my wife and I decided that if I was really going to engage and help lead this conversation within the church, because I had grown up in a border town, because I didn't grow up speaking my language, because I didn't grow up understanding my own culture, we decided we should probably move back to the reservation where I could immerse myself in that full time. And we moved there completely prepared to cook over a campfire or a camp stove, to live by candlelight, to haul our water, to use an outhouse, you know, to, to do all these yeah. things. But the thing that caught us completely off guard was how absolutely marginalized this community is. I literally felt like we dropped off the face of the earth. 
And one of the first things we, we learned is that by and large, the, the primary group of non-natives who come to Indian reservations are those who come to take your picture, are those who come to give you charity. Hmm. Very few people want to come and sit down and just have a cup of coffee with you huh. and sit and talk. Yeah. And then even of those who do that, even less come back. And I began trying to work through and talk about what I was feeling. As I was there, I, I witnessed the historical trauma and the complex PTSD of our communities coming from the boarding schools, coming from the removal, um, coming from the, just the trauma of growing up in, in a very impoverished neighborhood. And as I s experienced and saw this trauma and saw the pain of my community and began to understand how that was connected to the history of our nation, which I had studied some in college and I was beginning to look more into. Sure. One of the things that early on in that process, even before I learned about the doctrine discovery, but I knew the history was bad and I knew we were marginalized and I couldn't figure out what the challenge was. And I was trying to talk with my non-native friends about what I was feeling. Yeah. I could feel my uh, emotions rising. I could feel my anger growing and swelling. And soon I'd have to hang up the phone because I didn't want to start yelling at my friends. And so I learned how to temper myself. I learned how to talk about this like I had read it in the newspaper. Yeah. And then I could stay in the conversation longer, but it wasn't long until my friends would get defensive. Well, my family didn't do that to your people. Right. We weren't responsible for this. Yeah. And soon they would hang up the phone. And I was frustrated because I felt this swelling of emotion and I had no way to articulate it in a way that was honest to how I felt, but drew people into the conversation. And one day I was, I was sitting down and I was writing this like the 10th time, trying to get my, help my friends understand what I was experiencing. And in my letter to them, I said, being Native American and living on our reservation, it feels like our native communities are this old grandmother who has a very large and a very beautiful house. And years ago, some people came into our house and they locked us upstairs in the bedroom. Today, our house is full of people. They're sitting on our furniture, they're eating our food. They're having a party inside our house. Now they've since come upstairs. They've unlocked the door to our bedroom, but it's much later and we're tired, we're old, we're weak, or we're sick. So we can't or we don't come out. But the thing that hurts us the most, the thing that causes us the most pain is that virtually nobody from this party ever comes upstairs, seeks out the grandmother in the bedroom, sits down next to her on the bed, takes her hand, and simply says, thank you. Thank you for letting us be in your house. I wrote that and I'm like, that's it. That's how I feel. I started sharing it with people in our community and some people said to me, they said, I've lived here all my life and I've struggled to know how, our, how to articulate how it feels and you're hitting the nail on the head. I started sharing this with my non-native friends and as I spoke and traveled, and people would come up to me and say, what does it mean to say thank you? How does my family, how does my community, how does my church, how does my city, how does my government, my nation express gratitude to the host people of this land? See, now we're having a very, very different dialogue. Yeah. Now, instead of talking about victim versus oppressor and this massive power differential, now we're talking about what I think is the heart of the matter, which is this reversal of roles. Mm. You know, I was out herding sheep one day with one of our men on the sheep camp. He is also a boarding school survivor, speaks better Navajo than English. And I said, you know, the nation's talking about immigration reform. I'm curious, what are your thoughts? He said, well, there's already so many of them here. Maybe we shouldn't worry about borders anymore. Now, if you're anywhere else in the country, you immediately think he's talking about the 14 million undocumented who've come over the southern border, which is what everyone's screaming about. But because we're on a reservation, because we're both native, because he's a boarding school survivor, you have to pause and ask, is he talking about the 14 million or the 300 million? And I begin teaching people and saying in my, in my, in my, dialogues that without natives at the table, the United States of America is incapable of comprehensively and justly reforming immigration law. 
Without natives at the table, all you have is one generation of undocumented immigrants trying to figure out what to do with another generation of undocumented immigrants, and there's no integrity in the dialogue. And this is the dynamic we have in this nation, which is we have 300 million descendants of undocumented immigrants running around acting like they own the place. And we have six million indigenous hosts of the land being treated like unwanted guests in someone else's house. This video is inspired by our PBS series, Reconnecting Roots. Visit ReconnectingRoots.com to watch the full episodes or to check out our music and podcast. Give us a thumbs up and subscribe so we can keep making more. Thanks for watching.